Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. Today's topic is diabetes, chronic complications. So diabetes is an immense topic when you think about the etiology, the pathophysiology, the clinical presentation, the laboratory tests. There is so much to consider. So to keep it from being overwhelming, I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of it, which is the pathophysiology of the chronic complications of diabetes. Now, in order to do this, I have to begin by discussing the pathogenesis of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but then we're going to focus on the four distinct mechanisms by which hyperglycemia is going to cause the long-term complications of diabetes that you're going to see in your patients. So blindness, uh, lower extremity, uh, gangrene with uh, the need for amputation, um, atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, stroke. Okay, so before we begin, we have to think about what it is that insulin does in the body because diabetes is characterized by hyperglycemia. So insulin is how our body deals with an influx of, of sugar into the blood. So for example, I've just had a meal, my blood sugar is high, and what insulin says to my fat cells is, go ahead and take that sugar in, go ahead and make some fat, don't break it down because we're resource rich, we have abundant resources here, we want to build up, we want to be anabolic, not catabolic. So insulin is going to say something similar to my striated muscle. It's going to say, go ahead and suck up that glucose, make some glycogen for a rainy day, make some proteins, we have abundant resources. And then to the liver, insulin says, you don't need to make sugar, we got sugar. Go ahead and make some glycogen, make some lipids, let's go ahead and store what we've got. So that's what insulin is going to do. Now, in the case of type 1 diabetes, we don't have insulin due to beta cell destruction. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease due to T cell uh, self tolerance failure. And what happens there is that the T cells will destroy uh, beta cells in the uh, islets of the pancreas. This typically presents in childhood, and initially uh, children are asymptomatic, uh, even though they are beginning to have beta cell destruction. We see them here in the stage one where we have that beta cell autoimmunity, but they're normal uh, glycemic and they are pre-symptomatic. But as you get progressive uh, loss of your beta cells, now they're going to move to they're still pre-symptomatic, but they have dysglycemia. And finally, we're going to move for all the way uh, to symptomatic and type 1 diabetes. Diabetes. Now, one of the things that is uh, different between uh, type 1 diabetes and type 2 is that there's an increased risk of ketoacidosis and coma in type 1 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes is relatively uncommon as it is an autoimmune disease. By contrast, type 2 diabetes is very common in this country. It typically will present in individuals over 40, and they often are obese, but not always. So just because someone has a low BMI does not mean that you do not need to examine them and make sure they do not have diabetes. So do your laboratory tests. Typically, uh, patients will present um, with uh, an earlier stage of metabolic syndrome, which is characterized by obesity, hyperglycemia, increased serum triglycerides and cholesterol, and hypertension. And then we move on to type 2 diabetes, and in this case, un unlike the instance in type 1 diabetes where you had hyperglycemia because you don't have uh, enough insulin being produced by your beta cells, what we see in type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. So uh, the, the insulin is present, but you have decreased response in your peripheral tissues, particularly your skeletal muscle, fat, and liver. And in addition, you have beta cell dysfunction. So ordinarily, the body's going to sense this hyperglycemia and put out more and more insulin to deal with it. The beta cells are not able to do this appropriately in type 2 diabetes. Now, we talk a lot about uh, genetic predisposition in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In type uh, 2 diabetes, uh, even though the genetic association is stronger than what we see in type 1 diabetes, a much greater impact is due to your environmental factors, so central slash visceral obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and to a lower extent, uh, sleep disorders. And the reason type 2 diabetes is so important is because it's a leading cause of end-stage renal disease, adult onset blindness, and non-traumatic lower extremity amputations. So this is really a crisis uh, in, um, in our country. Uh, and as a pathologist, I see a lot uh, of pathology due to uh, this particular disease. 
Uh, so this is a hybrid figure I've put together from uh, uh, Robbins and Cotran uh, pathologic basis disease here at the bottom part, and then Robbins uh, and Kumar basic pathology 11th edition here. And what I want to talk about here is how hyperglycemia is going to lead us to uh, the complications of diabetes. All right, so here is our fat. And one thing to remember is that fat is not inert. It does a lot. It's putting out cytokines and hormones and uh, has a lot going on. So one of the things that fat can release are free fatty acids. And it's thought that the uh, the visceral fat, that uh, abdominal fat, is more prone to lipolysis than fat that's deposited in other parts of the body. That may be why that pattern of fat deposition is more closely associated with type 2 diabetes. So when these free fatty acids are released into the bloodstream, they undergo metabolism. Some of them are what we call toxic uh, lipid metabolites. And what these can do is that they can uh, decrease uh, insulin receptor signaling. Okay, so they're going to move down here towards peripheral uh, insulin resistance. Uh, they also can cause uh, islet inflammation. Uh, and through that, going through this inflammatory pathway can cause beta cell dysfunction. Now, one of the uh, other things that fats can do is they can secrete, as I mentioned, a variety of hormones and cytokines. Adipokines are some of the uh, substances, the mediators that can be secreted by fat cells. And uh, what some of these adipokines do is they promote uh, hyperglycemia. Others, like adiponectin, uh, typically increase insulin sensitivity. So if adiponectin is a good thing. However, adiponectin levels are going to decrease as a patient becomes obese. So obese patients will have less adip adiponectin, less insulin sensitivity. So taken as here again to peripheral insulin resistance. Now, I mentioned our free fatty acids before, and it's important to recognize that free fatty acids with glucose, when they're present in high amounts, are going to cause a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So taking us here down the inf inflammation pathway. And these pro-inflammatory cytokines are going to cause activation of the inflammasome, which is going to then release interleukin-1 beta. This interleukin-1 beta is going to cause the release of more pro-inflammatory cytokines, leading to increased insulin resistance. So over here. Now, what we can see early on um, in, uh, in type 2 diabetes uh, is that you have um, uh, the healthy individual here, so our insulin secretion is normal, our blood glucose is normal. As we start to move into beta cell dysfunction and peripheral insulin resistance, you're going to get a compensatory increase in your beta cells, which uh, will increase their secretion of insulin, and you may have normal to impaired glucose tolerance. But uh, as this progresses, we then finally get uh, beta cell failure, leading to decreased insulin secretion and full-on diabetes. So this is the type 2 diabetes picture here, not type 1. Okay, so this brings us to the pathogenic mechanisms of the chronic complications of diabetes. Now we have four listed here. This is going to be the most important one, the formation of the advanced glycation end products. I'm going to spend the most time on this. These also uh, are important but they're very, very complicated, and there are a lot of mediators involved, and so Robbins does not elaborate on this a lot. This is the one uh, that you really need to focus on. So let's leap into advanced glycation end products. So glycation basically means the non-enzymatic attachment of a glucose-derived metabolite and an amino group of intra- or extracellular proteins. So basically, you can get this happening uh, at any point when you have hyperglycemia, there's more sugar around, there's a higher risk of having this interaction occur. And once uh, these metabolites attach to the amino groups, they don't let go. So once they're on, they're on. And we actually take advantage of this to monitor uh, the historical um, average of an individual's blood glucose, right? So over the last uh, three months, which is the lifetime, uh, the lifespan of uh, a red blood cell. So what happens here is you have your uh, red cell floating around, it's got uh, increased uh, uh, sugar, and the sugar is going to bind to our hemoglobin, and we measure this as hemoglobin A1C. So what are these advanced glycation end products? 
So one of the things that they can do is they can bind to receptors for advanced glycation end products called RAGE. And these receptors are inflammatory cells, endothelial cells, and vascular smooth muscle. Now, if you go back to the atherosclerosis video, you'll see why all of these things are going to contribute towards our macro uh, vascular disease. So our uh, atherosclerosis, uh, the response of the endothelium to injury, all of these things. So when you have binding uh, to these cells, we're going to get release of cytokines and growth factors, generation of reactive oxygen species that can cause damage to your endothelium. And then this activated endothelium will also have a uh, procoagulant activity. The macrophages were going to be ramped up as well. And the uh, binding to these receptors is going to increase proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells and extracellular matrix synthesis. Okay. All of this should be very familiar to you as a setup for atherosclerosis, right? You have an inflammatory uh, milieu, you have reactive oxygen species, you have activated endothelial cells, we've got our vascular smooth muscle cells proliferating as we saw in atherosclerosis in those atherosclerotic plaques and your extracellular matrix. So all of that is going to contribute to your macrovascular complications of diabetes. Now, another thing that we can see is that independent of these receptors, these advanced glycation end products can cross-link to extracellular matrix proteins. And once they do that, those proteins become more stable. They're more resistant to proteolytic cleavage. This means that those proteins hang around. They accumulate. They're not easily removed. Now, two examples of this would be type 1 collagen, which we know is in vessel walls. When you have this cross-linking here, that's going to decrease your vessel elasticity. This means the vessel is not going to be responding as it should uh, to maintain laminar flow. This can create shear stress and endothelial injury. What do shear stress and endothelial injury cause? They lead us to atherosclerosis. Type 4 collagen, which is present in the basic membrane, can also be cross-linked by advanced glycation end products. This is going to lead to basement membrane thickening, which will decrease our endothelial adhesion and increase fluid extravasation. And what we see in the basement membrane uh, is readily apparent in the uh, histologic images you will see of um, uh, the glomeruli in diabetes. So, how do advanced glycation end products contribute to the vascular consequences of chronic diabetes? Let's look first at our macrovascular disease, our large and medium-sized muscular arteries. And the primary issue that occurs here is accelerated atherosclerosis because of all of the uh, factors that I mentioned in the previous slide. So this is going to lead to myocardial infarction, the most common cause of death in patients with diabetes, also to cerebrovascular accident. And as you get um, peripheral uh, vascular um, atherosclerosis, patients will begin initially presenting with uh, ischemic uh, findings such as claudication, increased pain due to ischemia as they walk, and this can then lead to uh, frank gangrene, which is going to necessitate uh, amputation. More on that later. Uh, another uh, uh, set of vascular consequences is due to microvascular disease, so the small vessels. And this is characterized by diffuse thickening of the basement membranes. So this is what's going to contribute to your end-stage renal disease, in which we see arteriolosclerosis of both the afferent and efferent arterioles. I mentioned in the, um, the video on uh, the um, pathology of uh, the retina, that diabetic retinopathy uh, is associated with blindness. This is due to that ischemia, which is going to prompt uh, the retina to uh, make more blood vessels, which can uh, have an impact uh, on vision. Uh, and we'll also uh, mention the fact that, if you'll recall with that neovascularization, if the neovascularization goes uh, over the iris, this can cause closed angle glaucoma. And finally, although we didn't discuss it in the retinal pathology video, we, we just mentioned the fact that it existed that cataracts are associated with diabetes. That's due to sorbitol, and we'll talk about sorbitol in a couple of slides. Finally, as far as diabetic microvascular disease, is you can get that peripheral neuropathy, which is thought to be due to ischemic changes, as well as issues related to advanced glycation, uh, end products, and sorbitol. 
All right, let's go through our last three pathways or mechanisms, the activation of protein kinase C and how that contributes to the chronic uh, complications of diabetes. So when you have intracellular hyperglycemia, the cell is going to be begin making diacylglycerol. With uh, what diacylglycerol is going to do is activate protein kinase C. And when protein kinase C is activated, it is going to stimulate the synthesis of vascular uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, and plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, right? And these have a variety of different effects. It's not just, you know, one protein, one effect. These are going to interact in a variety of different pathways, and things get complicated very quickly. But suffice to say that these are going to contribute to microangiopathy. Uh, as I mentioned, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 is procoagulant, so that is going to be an issue in the development of your atherosclerosis. Now, as we talk about another mechanism, this is referred to as oxidative stress and polyol pathway disturbance. Just a small amount of material in Robbins on this. Again, it's going to be intracellular hyperglycemia, and that's going to draw, drive the production of a compound called sorbitol. Now, sorbitol can then be further metabolized to fructose when NADPH uh, becomes NADB, uh, NADP positive, right? So once uh, this occurs, um, then we are using up our store of NADPH, which we need to generate reduced glutathione. As you'll recall uh, from earlier in Robbins in uh, chapter uh, two, I believe we talk about uh, reactive oxygen species and glutathione is a very important antioxidant. When you have decreased glutathione, that's going to lead to oxidative stress. Now, sorbitol on its own is going to uh, result in blindness due to accumulation in the lens causing cataract formation. And then our final mechanism is to bring back something that you may or may not have learned earlier in your medical career, the hexosamine pathway. So most glucose is going to be metabolized through glycolysis, a very small amount through the hexosamine pathway. When you have hyperglycemia, it's going to drive uh, fructose 6-phosphate through this path pathway, which is going to, through a variety of mechanisms, increase gene expression of TGF, TGF alpha, TGF beta 1, and again, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. Now, as I mentioned, um, uh, PAI1 is procoagulant, and we know that TGF beta 1 also plays a role in cellular hypertrophy and extracellular matrix synthesis. So you can see of these last three pathways, there's a little bit more hand waving. It's not as well defined as what we know for our advanced glycation end products. And I'm just going to uh, finish up here with an image from the 11th edition of Robbins uh, in Kumar Basic Pathology, showing you in just one graphic what it is uh, that um, are the uh, chronic complications of uh, diabetes. So we'll begin down here at the feet. We have that peripheral vascular atherosclerosis uh, due to our advanced glycation end products. This can lead to gangrene. The peripheral neuropathy, which is shown here as well, can lead to uh, infections and ulcers, the uh, infections due to decreased blood flow, and then the progression of this uh, lesion because the patient doesn't feel pain. So they can have an ulcer on the sole of their foot and not be aware of it. So this is going to to uh, typically result in an amputation. Uh, the uh, peripheral neuropathy can also affect the autonomic nervous system, so the bladder can be affected. Uh, when we think about our microvascular complications, that's going to affect uh, the kidneys. So we have nephrosclerosis due to glomerulosclerosis, uh, and we also have our arteriolosclerosis. Uh, the consequences of our large uh, and medium vessel disease is going to uh, manifest as myocardial infarct uh, and in uh, cerebrovascular disease uh, and, uh, and in hypertension. And then finally, our microvascular disease is going to be seen in the retinopathy, uh, which uh, is due to uh, that ischemia uh, as those uh, capillaries of the retina are occluded. Uh, and then to uh, cataracts uh, from the sorbitol pathway and glaucoma with neovascularization of the iris. Okay, so now just to ask a few questions so you can test your knowledge on this. So what are the four mechanisms that contribute to the chronic complication uh, of, of diabetes? And finally, um, 
how do advanced glycation end products uh, contribute to the macro and microvascular uh, pathology and chronic diabetes. I hope you have found this useful. I know it's a lot of material, but I'm putting it together in an unusual way that I hope will help uh, it to stick. Uh, please do put comments below and let me know if you found this helpful. Thank you very much.